29. Today we're going to continue with the lent Lorentz equations. If you recall, the last time what we did was to look at the fixed points to basically start doing the linear analysis. So what we had was that we found we had a fixed point at the origin, okay, and then we had a second fixed point at um, two distinct points that were different by plus and minus. Remember these equations have a symmetry where x goes to minus x and y goes to minus y and the equations remain the same. And so we had the second fixed point and if we think back about the water wheel, the one fixed point is just nothing happens. And then the two fixed points was the water wheel rotates the one way with constant velocity and the other way with constant velocity. So that's what they were. And then we started analyzing what these fixed points actually did. And we worked out the Jacobian matrix and we got as far as the fixed point at the origin. And what we showed was that the fixed point at the origin, the z component always approaches z equals to zero. And then the other components are stable, right? They're a node or a spiral if r is less than one, okay, and the saddle if r is greater than one. And so we showed linear stability if r is less than one. So what I'm going to do today is just start at that fixed point, finish it off, because linearly stable does not necessarily mean globally stable, but in this case it is. So in this case, the next result we're going to show is basically for r between zero and one, remember r is always positive, um, the only place where the solutions are going to go is to the origin. It's completely stable. In other words, in the case when you view the, the water wheel, nothing happens. It doesn't spin. If you look at the convection roll, it just, there's no rolls. It's just solid. It's not moving at all. And so the way we do that is to look at the global stability of the origin. And so this thing actually serves very well for a bit of revision as well. Um, so the global stability of the origin, and we're going to look just if R is less than 1, because it makes no sense of asking whether it's globally stable if it's linearly unstable, right? So you always ask whether it's globally unstable. And the way we do it, we know the fixed point is linearly stable. And what we want to prove is that every trajectory goes to that point. So linear stability, remember, is just a small region we guarantee goes to the point. We want to prove every trajectory goes to that point. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a technique we've all introduced in two dimensions. And the technique we're going to do is um, basically that we're going to introduce a Lyapunov function. So just to say, if it goes to the origin, if every trajectory grows to the origin, there's nothing else, right? There's no limit cycles and okay, so just go shoop. Okay, so the proof is basically use a Lyapunov function. And this one I'm going to, so if you remember where we used in the past, when we looked at the, the pendulum, we could, for the conservative system, we could get the energy. And then the moment we had the dam system, we showed that the energy along every trajectory, the energy would decrease. So all the trajectories sort of ran downhill of that energy profile we did out. Did there. And you can do that in three dimensions, and this is exactly what we're going to do here. So just like what we did in the friction system with a conservative potential and then watching how it changes if you add damping, so too we're going to do it here. Um, and we're going to simply find a function, and we're going to show that along the trajectory, this function, the v dot, or the, yeah, v dot, we're going to, if we call the function v, then v dot decreases. And so what we're going to do, the function we're going to choose is that one, okay? It has to be, the only restriction on the function is it has to be any positive definite function. Um, remember, that is zero at the, the point that you're approaching. And the reason for choosing that one is that it works. So what typically happens if you get equations like this and you know your origin is stable and you want to try and prove it's globally stable, there's no guarantees. You keep on looking for various functions until it works. Okay. And this one does, if it were me starting from scratch, if, if I were um, Lorentz and I got the problem fresh, then what I would have done is just like we did in one of the problem sets, I would choose a function with parameters in front and choose it quadratic or to the fourth order 
Usually, I would for this problem, I would choose it quadratic because you only get quadratic things there. Okay, so that's the reason for the quadratic guess. And then I would simply choose these parameters so that I can prove that v dot goes to zero and that it remains positive definite. So that if I had to wa if find a way of guessing, that would be it. All I'm going to do for this case is actually give you the thing that works and then just show that it works. Okay, because this is slightly more complicated. We're now doing in three dimensions. But all the argumentation we worked out in two di for the two-dimensional Lyapunov function is still valid. So just to give you an idea of what this function looks like, it's sort of like a sphere, except that this one side has got a different um, scaling. And so if you look at V equals to constant level sets, they're basically concentric ellipsoids, and they look like that, right? So the bigger the V you make it, the bigger the ellipsoid, and it sort of shrinks. And you can see the, um, the y and the z are like a circle, but the x and y, or x and z, are ellipses because you have this 1 over sigma in front of here. And so if you have that, you can now have to show that v dot is less than 0 um, along the trajectories. And we're going to only care about if r is less than 1 and we're not at the origin. So remember there were those various things that you had to prove for the Lyapunov function. You do them exactly here. Okay, and so what it means, if that is true, is that the trajectory passes to smaller and smaller ellipsoid as it goes along in time. Okay, and so what we do is we simply work out the half V dot, and there we have it. I just put the half because it makes it more compact. So we have xx dot over sigma, yy dot over 1, zz dot over there. And then we go about and we substitute in each of these differential equations. So the xx dot over sigma simply becomes xy minus x squared, and the sigma is cancelled there. So you can see why the sigma arose. The second, the yy dot, is simply y times this thing, and there we have it. And the zz dot is simply z times that thing. And you can see that very, very conveniently, the two red things cancel. And what you're left with is everything in black. Okay? And so you, these, there are, two, there are things that are easy. All these things with a minus in front of the square are naturally negative. Okay? But the thing that provides you with a problem is this x, y term, okay? Because that could be either positive or negative. And the trick to get rid of this thing is to write it as a complete differential with x squared. Okay, so what we're going to do, remember if you have x plus, um, say, f squared, then it's basically x squared, sorry, if you have minus brackets x plus f squared, then it's like, x squared plus 2xf plus um, f squared. So you can say we put everything in front of x over here equals to 2f. So what we then have, okay, I've just made one more simplification. What we then have is we can write this thing as minus, there your x comes from the x squared, then you have everything in front of x divided by 2, and it's a different sign, so it's minus. Okay, and so this thing is now negative. Okay, so that's fine. We must just add back, because this thing adds in uh, r plus 1 y over 2 squared term. Okay, so, so we add this thing back. So we have our y squared term. This first one comes from over there. And the second part comes from this thing that we've had to subtract so that we get back to the original thing. Okay, so this is r plus 1 over 2 squared minus, and then we have times y squared, and then we have minus bz squared. So it's a, another technique for just getting rid of these things and making sure that you're negative. The only catch is this thing, then we've got a problem here, and we must make very, very sure when this thing has to be positive in the bracket in order for the whole thing to be negative. And you can show that it changes sign 
when this thing is equals to zero or when r plus one over two is equals to one or r is equals to one. Okay, so we have that if r is less than one, we know that the bracket is always greater than zero. Okay, and therefore this whole thing is less than zero and we've got what we've shown. So the trajectories are, you're going to basically have these equipotential ellipses, trajectory's going to run downhill them to zero, zero. And so you have shown that zero is globally stable for R less than one. Okay. So we've done with the origin. We only care about it when it's less than one, otherwise it becomes a saddle and it basically has a mo direction that comes in and then it kicks things out the other direction. So let's move on to considering the case if R is greater than one. Okay, so the origin's a saddle point, and what we have to do then is we have to look for other fixed points. So the other fixed points we have, remember, was that two pair of points. And we found them, we could find them in, ter in terms of the parameters. We had Z star is equals to R minus one, and we had x star, y star is equal to plus minus, so they, these are the two points, the square root of b times r minus 1. And Lorenz in his paper, when he worked with them, is he called these ones the c plus, let's call it with a plus square root and the c minus, okay? So that's just so I can label my fixed points or talk to them. And be historically respectful, because you tend to, when you write something and somebody's made a good analysis, you tend to keep their notation just to, in some sense, to honor the way they found the first answer. Okay, so the stability, we once again going to do everything we can do with a linear analysis, because linear analysis is nice, it's something we can do to actually find the answer. So what we need to st linear stability is to work out the characteristic equation. Okay, and I'm actually going to do the full thing here. It's a problem in Strogatz, but it's an important problem, and I actually wanted to give you an example of um, how to do it in three dimensions because we worked out the general theory for three-dimensional matrices right at the beginning, okay, and we did an exercise with it, but I just wanted to show you one more example, a little bit for revision, but also a little bit to teach like rapid computational tricks. So look at how I do it, know how to do it. Um, it's, it's a nice question to ask. Okay, so we have to work out the stability we have to work out the characteristic equation. We had it from the previous, um, we worked out the general Jacobian, and here I've simply substituted in what y is, it's equals to x star, and at one point I substituted what z is exactly as well. So this is now our Jacobian. Our characteristic equation is not the one that we worked out in two dimensions. Do not make that mistake. Remember in two dimensions we had a way of getting a trace and a determinant. You can't do that in three dimensions, especially not if this thing is full. You actually have to work out the full determinant of this matrix minus a lambda i. Okay? And if you do that, you're going to get a polynomial that is cubic. In other words, you're going to have a term, so you basically work out the determinant using that cofactor matrices, and then, you, and then I expanded it, and what I get then is basically minus lambda squared plus the constant term, and the only reason I wrote it in that order is so that I could fit everything onto the next line, um, plus all these things multiplied by lambda squared um, plus x squared times lambda. The cool, so this is the characteristic equation. If you solve it, you can get lambda, you can get your eigenvalues in principle, and you can know if they're all negative, the thing is stable. If, the, if so, two are negative and one is positive, it's unstable because it's going to run away along the positive one. Um, but what I want to do now is simply give you some tricks. So this is your characteristic equation. Formally, you can always get it. But how do you actually say something if you have a mess like that. So I just want to show you how I went about it so you can use it as a practice for later on. The first thing to notice here is a relief. In other words, we only have to do it once because only x squared occurs there. So both c plus and c minus, right, x squared is the same for both of them, so they both behave in the same way. Okay, so that simplifies things. The other thing is that x squared has a reasonably simple expression in terms of the parameters is just b times r minus 1. So I can go in 
and replace x squared in both places. Okay, so I've just rearranged the bits in the right order. So here's minus lambda squared, minus lambda cubic, minus lambda squared over there, minus lambda, and I've replaced x squared over there. Okay, so it simplifies even more. And then I've explaced x squared over in the constant term. So you have minus 2 sigma times b times r minus 1. So that is my characteristic equation. So the thing I use to look at this equation is, and I want to get the actual roots. I want to say something about the solution and when the bifurcations take place without actually solving that equation completely analytically. I want a shortcut. So the one comment is, you can. It's a cubic equation. Um, so you can formally find a solution. So any equation that's less than order 4, there's this theorem that says you, get, you can write down an analytic solution. They aren't pretty, and we don't actually need the full solution to say when the thing is stable, but I'm just telling you of the result. So the way I go about actually trying to find out or say whether bifurcations take place or whether it's stable or not is to do the following trick, okay? I'm going to say, let the eigenvalues be lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3, okay? Then I'm going to say, my characteristic equation is just lambda 1 minus lambda, lambda 2 minus lambda, lambda 3 minus lambda, right? I'm factoring this thing, but not explicitly, just formally. And then I multiply it out, so I have minus lambda squared minus, sorry, minus lambda cubic minus the sum of the lambdas, the roots times lambda squared, um, plus lambda times a combina quadratic combination of the things, plus the product of the three. Okay, and what is interesting to note over here is, um, one, oh, oh, wait, I'll just, I'll keep, keep the thought. Okay, so these are the things, the three equations that you get, and what you can do now is you can take these things and it, compare them to this polynomial and set them equal. So you can say, let tau be lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3, and it is also equals to minus 1 plus b plus sigma. Okay. And the reason I've called it tau, because this is sort of making a connection with a two-dimensional one, because I want to show you what the difference is. The reason I've called it tau is that this thing is basically the trace of the matrix. And it is always so, right? The three roots is always equals to the trace of the matrix for which you're writing down the characteristic equation. And you can see how it generalizes from the second order case. Okay. The second thing is, let's delta equals to lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. And that is equals to minus b sigma r minus 1. And if you are very careful, you'll see that that is the determinant of this thing. Okay. You can actually check that. So you're going to have, so your second constant is your, so you have your, trace, you have your determinant, and that's this thing. But then you have a thing you did not get in two dimensions. The final one is this quadratic term that you can compare, and that is equals to um, this one just by comparing it. Okay, so you now have a different way of looking at the problem of your roots. And what I want to do now, and so you can see you can play little games, like there's, if they're not completely independent. So you can write lambda 2 and lambda 3 as this thing minus lambda 1. And here you can write lambda 1 as this thing, sorry, you can write lambda 2 multiplied by lambda 3 as this thing divided by lambda 1. And then you can actually substitute it in here and remove lambda 2 and lambda 3. Okay? We're not going to do it, but this is some tricks that you can play if you actually want to get the exact answer. What we're going to do instead is take a shortcut. We're only interested um, in where the fixed points change sign. Okay, so the fixed points are stable if, if and only if all the eigenvalues are less than zero. So the bifurcations can occur if one of your eigenvalues go to zero. 
Okay, so if that happens, you're basically going to have this delta equals to zero, and um, that's only going to occur because B and sigma are positive when R is equals to one. Okay, so that bifurcation we've gotten rid of. Okay, it only occurs if R equals to one, and that's where the, the fixed points are born. The second kind, remember what we did in the two-dimensional case is we can have the eigenvalues change stability, but they need not necessarily be zero. You can have a pair of complex conjugates go across the imaginary axis, and we call that the Hopf bifurcation. And so the same thing can happen here. Okay, so if that's going to happen, you can say you have a pair of complex imaginary, you have a pair of imaginary complex conjugate eigenvalues, and you can actually see where that occurs. So suppose you have, and that's the Hopf bifurcation. So suppose we assume that lambda plus minus, and I'm just going to call it plus minus, this is say lambda 1, lambda 2, is equals to i omega. Okay? And the third eigenvalue is still less than zero. So I'm going to take this assumption and substitute it in here and then work out the consequences. Okay, so if I take this assumption, I put it in there, then what I have is basically this last equation, right? Um, lambda plus plus lambda, well, let's look at it. So we have lambda 1, which is basically lambda plus, lambda 1 times lambda plus plus lambda minus, okay, so that's 0, plus lambda plus times lambda minus, so that's basically omega squared, or minus omega squared, because there's a minus in front of there, is equals to minus br plus sigma. So there's the first equation. Okay? What we're second going to have is lambda 1, that's the trace, is simply lambda 1, lambda plus plus lambda minus, those are 0. So you're going to have lambda 1 is equals to that. And then finally, you're basically going to look at the product of these three, Okay, and the product of those three is lambda 1 times uh, sort of lambda plus plus lambda minus times omega squared times um, this, this thing over here. And I think I've got a sign mistake. Okay, so sorry about the sign mistake. So that's that expression. And so what you can see, I have three equations... I've got my parameters in here, and if I place omega squared in there and lambda 1 in there, I'm going to have an expression for R, sigma, and beta that has to be satisfied. And that's the point at, the hop at which the Hopf bifurcation takes place. So what I do now is I eliminate lambda 1 and omega, and what I leave, what I get is basically... Okay, I've put in omega over there. I've put in lambda 1 over there. Okay, and you can see I made the minus sign mistake twice. So this bottom one is right, that one is wrong. Okay, and then I have that this is equals to this thing. And that is very nice because you can see it's linear in R. So what I can do is I can solve for R, I can divide through by B, because B is greater than zero, and I can solve for R, and I have that RH occurs at that value. So there's a distinct value at which you have this Hopf bifurcation, and the thing goes from being a stable fixed point to an unstable fixed point, and it, it, gets, it also tells you more than that. It says your unstable fixed point, it's first a stable spiral, then it transitions to an unstable spiral. And um, so what we have is that the C plus minus is linearly stable if, one, if R lies between 1 and RH, okay, because then all the eigenalities are negative. Um, if at RH, what happens is they switch from a stable spiral, excuse me, to an unstable spiral. And so what you can see we do, we're systematically pushing back what we know using the linear analysis and it's necessary. It was the first step that Lyapunov, or not Lyapunov, Lorenz also did. It's the logical step because you know how to compute. And so I just want to give you a picture of what happens once we go past RH. Okay. 
I'm going to say a little bit more about this. Remember, you had two types of hop bifurcations. You had the one where it sort of was like this, and then it behaved like a pitchfork. Okay, and you went from a zero limit cycle to something that had a thing, and then you could actually split them off. This is not that one. This is the, the subcritical hop. It's the one that just goes kachush and vanishes. Which is, remember I told you the last time, it's an important one. It's what gives birth to chaos very often. Okay, but we don't know that yet. Okay, and when, because it's a subcritical hop, and I'll show you the picture in the next slide, what basically happens is there, the solution just jumps. And nobody knew where it jumped to until Lorenz, like, very cleverly argued what it was. Okay. So, let's just say, let's now look at the case where R is greater than RH. Okay, the C plus minus goes unstable. And just to give you an idea of what this looks like, because it also starts to explain those spirals that we saw. Remember, we sort of saw that it had these butterflies, and I'll sketch it again. And it sort of jumped, then it spiraled outwards, and it looked as if it was stuck on a plane, and then it jumped back and did this. Okay, so you can see where it starts getting born. So just around the, um, the C+, plus, right, we now have that... This is the lambda one direction. That still remains negative. So it's all going to squash to a plane. But once you're on that plane, what it's going to do is you're going to start in close here. You're going to get to this fixed point, and you're going to spiral out. Okay, so it gives you that, you know, the jumping where it spirals out? This is where it comes from. You can already start to see it, at least an idea, a hint of it, when you start doing the linear analysis, simply by looking at the eigenvalues. Okay. Except that normally the other cases, it jumped like the case we did with the, with the portic, with a fourth order solution that looked like this. It almost jumped and then it went to another branch. Here we haven't showed where it's going to jump to. Okay, so just here is the full summary. If R is less than 1, you have the origin, then that goes unstable. The next fixed point, and this is just the x coordinate of the fixed point, the two are born in a sort of in a pitchfork. And they then increase as R increases. And then eventually you reach this RH, and then it just vanishes. You have your unstable limit cycle. OK. And so this is how far Lorenz got. And this is how far the, the basically all the pre preparation before that got him. And then it was a mystery story. OK. And the way he answered it is he asked himself several questions. And then he systematically eliminated possibilities. Okay. So there is a way which we didn't do in this class to check to prove that it's a subcritical hop bifurcation in algebraic weights in one of the exercises in Strogat. But anyway, you can prove that this thing, without actually not eliminating the other things, you can actually prove that it's a subcritical hop by taking derivatives of the functions. And so he knew there was a small region that would attract the, lim the limit cycle, even below the bifurcation point, but very soon you would be pushed it out. So even when you have the stable spiral, if you start out here, very weird things are going to happen. Um, and so what he did was he started asking a number of questions, and he got definitive answers. So the first question is, these equations are hard, right? There might be a limit cycle that we just don't know about. Okay, and this was maybe the hardest question he asked. And then so he basically, is there a limit cycle elsewhere? In other words, is there a limit cycle, say, with, uh, over there and there, where it just is periodic? And the answer is no. Okay, and the argument for no we'll do in the next lecture. Okay, that's one of the ways you really pushed our understanding further. He ruled it out. He didn't rule it out mathematically rigorously, but he gave the argument for ruling that for the first time ever. I'll tell you what the mistake is, or the incompleteness is that he made next lecture. But it was a very beautiful argument. It is this argument that actually changed the way we actually describe the chaos. Okay, he actually showed that the system became a different system that we could actually analyze. Very, very clever. Okay, so that's the hardest question. The second one is, could the trajectories escape to infinity? Um, which is a plausible thing, right? If you look at 1D systems, they either go to a fixed point or they run away to infinity. And the answer is no, okay? And there he once again was very clever as well because he constructed, he basically showed that all the trajectories are bounded 
and they enter and remain in a large ellipsoid. Okay, and that analysis is beautifully elegant. It's one. It's an exercise that you can do. I'll give you like some exercises that you can practice. But it basically means that once again, like that V ellipsoid that we showed the global stability, you could also use that ellipsoid. He showed that if your your if you if that ellipsoid is big enough, you once again going to make an ellipsoid, and all the trajectories are going to move inward, and therefore it's going to you can't, it's not true all the way to the center, but if the ellipsoid is big enough, they all move in over the ellipsoid so you have a trapping region. So he basically, if the moment you have that ellipsoid, he showed that all the trajectories go over it once it's big enough, and then it gets stuck in this ellipsoid. And so what, if you were working in two dimensions, you would have said you have a limit cycle, but you're working in three, and the Poincaré prediction is only valid for two. But you at least know you have something there. You've, you've, you've caged your beast, right? Um, so, very clever. So, then it was, let's start thinking of what can happen in three dimensions that can't happen in two. Right? In two, we have fixed points, limit cycles, done. In three, what we have is he asked the question, could all the trajectories settle along a torus? And the reason for asking that, okay, is that it's possible then to make something that's not periodic, but that is contained in a box. So you can imagine you have a torus like this, and you have a trajectory, and it just winds, all that keeps going round and round the torus, and then even it might get very close, and then it just wind, keeps going round and round and round. So it's possible to make something that's not a closed limit cycle, but that goes around infinitely like that. Um, and he says, okay, fine, that's a three-dimensional thing. Could it be that? And the answer is no. Do you know why it's no? Ah, it's also, so the, right at the beginning, remember, we showed that you have that volume contraction. So we basically proved if you start in the sphere, it would shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. The torus encloses a solid volume, so it can't be that. So very subtle, very clever, but it just took out that thing as well. So we're looking for something that doesn't have volume. So by volume contraction, okay, so no. And the question is, what then? What? Have, no. So then he was basically, I've never seen anything like this in my life. What could it be? Okay, and the answer was that he slowly teased out, and we'll do some of that argumentation, um, mainly sometimes by plotting things by just getting a feel from it, what he slowly teases out is the trajectories approach what they call a strange attractor. And we're going to, I'm not going to do it properly, properly, but I am going to start giving you ideas of what that, mathematically what that is. And what a strange attractor is, is basically a limiting set um, of zero volume. Um, and the name, actually, Lorenz didn't call it a strange attractor, he just described it. The lane actually comes from a, a very good, if you're interested in chaos, um, what's it, Ruler and Tolkien's wrote a very good book called Chaos. And they described it and they described, you know, it was sort of more a popular book. So it sort of gives you a history of the field and the applications of it. And there are. There are amazing applications of chaos in cryptography and all sorts of things. Um, so anyway, the, the name comes from these guys. But what Lorenz did is he basically went about and he looked at what the distracted could be. And so the first attribute that we're going to look at today, or sort of start introducing today and then analyze more completely in our last lecture, is in three dimensions. Remember that picture I showed you of the, 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 um, the thing actually doing that? It goes from the one point, spirals out, goes to the next, then jumps, goes in, spirals out to the next one. So uh, what Lorenz basically did is he first described exactly what he saw, not because he'd plotted it, but because he's, well, he sort of started plotting it. He had to find a way of describing it. And so what he described was, in three dimensions, um, the Lorentz attractor appears to move on a branch surface, right? You have these two wings, and then somehow they, like, go into each other as they switch over from the one to the other, okay? That was shaped like a mask, and there it is, okay? So... They, he started viewing the attractor as a set of all possible points that a trajectory could go through. And that was his first attempt. Okay, so here you have, you basically have this feature 
where, say, a trajectory comes in, hits the plane near the fixed point, then it spirals out. Remember, the fixed point is unstable. It basically goes around, spirals out like this. When it gets big enough, it's going to hop over to the next one, go around like this, and spiral again, and then come back. Okay, so, and he said, the, the attractor, he just had a rough example, I mean, because he didn't know what he's doing, he's trying to grapple with it. He said, like, that's our first attempt, okay? So it's kind of like a surface, except that it can't be. Okay, so, but it can't be a single surface. Why can't it be a single surface? So the problem with a single surface happens, you've got this point where the two things cross over. If it's on a single surface, the point at which it crosses over, you can have a trajectory that's going to stay on the surface, go one to one fixed point, or you can have a trajectory that goes to the other fixed point. And the uniqueness of ODEs rules that out. It's impossible to have a trajectory with two possible futures. Okay, so even though it looks like it, and the trajectories get really, really close when they weave in between each other, they cannot mathematically be on the same surface. Okay, so it looks like a surface, but it cannot be a single surface because that violates the uniqueness of solutions. So you can see how cleanly Lorentz knew his theorems, right? He knew the uniqueness, he knew its implications, and he was like, ah, it looks like it, but what's not doing that? It's not allowed to. What else do I do? And that argument, that very crisp argumentation led him to making a breakthrough. Okay, so it looks like a surface, it can't be a surface, because mainly when these guys like we between, they can't, they can't be exactly on the same surface. So what is it instead? Okay, it's actually a tightly packed, infinite complexes of surface that moves, that's together, right? Because every time it like hops into this side and it spirals out, that's effectively a surface, right? And then, so then it moves in and hops into the other one and you've like squashed these surfaces between each other just with a little enough room that they can cross over but not hit each other. Okay, so he described this as a tightly packed infinite complexes of surfaces. And in fact, much, much later, they showed it was a fractal. In fact, he, in fact, started showing it was a fractal. He just didn't know that he'd started other people on the right track. Okay, so it's a fractal. And I'll also I'll give you one example of that next to lecture because it ties in very nicely with how he proved it would not be a limit cycle. So in proving, basically, that you did not have a limit cycle, he put down the foundations for proving that, he, he sort of put everything there so that the next people could go ahead and show that it was actually fractal. Okay, it's a fractal, and that means it has volume zero, which we require because we proved that everything shrinks. And when you start problems like this, you like struggle, right? You're like, I've proved this, it's solid, it's mathematically rigorous, it's no zero volume, yet it can't be a surface, what's going on? Okay, so, he proved that it's a f basically, and then I find another argumentation, which is what Lorenz did. He didn't show it was a fractal. The fact the thing that actually was fractal came later on. Using his analysis, somebody proved it. Okay, so it has zero volume, but it has infinite surface area. Okay. Um, and so its dimension, it has zero volume, so it cannot have three dimensions. It's not a surface, and it has infinite surface area, so it's got to have a dimension bigger than two. And so what they showed was, for the Lorentz attractor, it actually has, is a fractal with dimension 2.04. So it's very, very, very close to a surface. That 0.4 is just the thing that allows those little trajectories to squeak past each other. Okay, so that's the mystery up until this point. And so what I'll do tomorrow, or the last lecture, is just give you a very quick um, introduction to why Lorentz ruled out the limit cycle, which is the, the important one. And also when I do that, I st I'll give you some feel of what this fractal is like, because it came out, the way he ruled it out was exceedingly clever. Um, and, the way, and then when he ruled it out, he basically showed that it was a fractal inside. It just fell out of the way he did it. And what he did was, he had to take this complicated surface picture 
and you had to find a way of understanding it. And the thing he did was so simple, but it was the first time he did it. He said, let me look. It was very similar to what Poincaré did. Let me not care about this thing that's doing all these complicated dynamics. The only thing I need to worry about is that at some point, the trajectory is going to go, go into the next fixed point. It's going to start at a low value. It's going to spiral out to a maximum value. And then it's going to go to the next one, start a low value, spiral at the maximum value. Let me understand where, how, it, how the maximum value at which it leaves this one influences the minimum value and the next maximum value at which it comes out. That's all I care about. I want a one-dimensional thing. And he looked at that one-dimensional thing, studied it for the Lorentz attractor, and the rest came out. Okay, so that's the, the what's it? What do you call the, the trailer for the next lecture? Thank you. <laughs> do you have questions? Yes. That I haven't told you. Um, it comes from the actual fractal that's in there. So he didn't come in. This time, he just showed that it wasn't, he argued that it couldn't be dimension two. And he knew that it had, couldn't be, had to be dimension three, so he basically said it was in between. Okay, and then where the, the dimensionality came out was, he also introduced the idea of the, fra the, the he's an, he didn't call it a fractal. He, the way he analyzed it, and this is what we'll see, when he started comparing where this one jumps to the next one, he basically set up a structure that has fractals inside. And so all he did was prove that you wouldn't have a limit cycle and that you would um, basically have this surface and that w which wasn't a surface. He didn't actually, I don't think he found the dimension. Okay, the, this is harder, but it comes from the property of the actual fractal. And I don't think I'll actually get to the dimension, but I'll give you, you, you can actually read a bit further in Strogatz once I start you out, if, you, if you're interested. So no, I can't tell you that answer fully. I can give you a basic example of that. Let me just switch off. The